So uh, it is a, a tremendous honor for me to be invited here today. Let me thank uh, several people. In, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Latif of the Foreign Policy Association. I want to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for uh, uh, its role in this and uh, the New York uh, University Center for Dialogues and, and Dr. Mustafa in particular. So I have to start with a little bit of um, a uh, confession. The title of my talk is, as Professor Mustafa said, Beyond Political Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Future of the Middle East. And I realize now there are a couple of bits of dishonesty in this title. The first is, uh, be, the, big, the first part, Beyond Political Islam. It occurred to me as I was reviewing this talk um, that it's very much, uh, it doesn't go beyond political Islam, it's very much mired in it. So we're going to uh, talk a lot about political Islam. Uh, the second is that it promises to tell you something about the future, right? It says the future of um, the Middle East. Um, and one thing I think that political scientists like myself have been able to demonstrate um, quite, uh, 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 quite certainly is that we have absolutely no ability to predict the future. Um, and the third bit of dishonesty is that I said the Middle East, and really what I'm going to talk about is Egypt. Uh, because I think Egypt, as um, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte said in his exile in the Isle of St. Helena, his, uh, his British warden interviewed him and said, hey man, why did you invade Egypt in 1798? And Napoleon said, because Egypt is the most important country in the world. So that, uh, you should be laughing now, but I think you're not because you understand that it's true. Uh, so I'm going to talk a lot about Egypt. Now, um, You've probably all been doing a lot of reading about the uh, so-called Arab Spring and the revolution in Egypt in particular, and you probably in your readings have noticed that views of the event and its aftermath basically uh, veer between one of two extremes, either a kind of sunny optimism on the one hand or an unremitting pessimism on the other. And the optimism is particularly apparent in the very early writings on the revolution. So when the crowds first gathered in Tunisia in December of 2010, and then they start gathering in Cairo and Egypt in January of 2011, and uh, then those gathering crowds actually led to the flight of these long-standing dictators, it was impossible to not be optimistic or even euphoric about the changes that were happening uh, in the Middle East, especially since the people who were bringing us those changes were not the bearded Islamists of the Western nightmare, but rather these really young, uh, photogenic looking people uh, like uh, this young lady. This is uh, Gigi Ibrahim, who is a revolutionary socialist and featured in a lot of media reports on the uh, revolution in uh, Egypt, and this gentleman, uh, Wet al Ghunaym, who is a Google uh, marketing executive and who is one of the uh, administrators of a web page that was a key organizing center of the uh, revolution. So, to capture something of the giddy spirit of that particular era, let me read for you a statement that uh, President Obama is reported to have made. So, this was reported in the New York Times uh, that some oh, staffer of Obama's uh, said, uh, you know, the president was asked in some meeting, what do you hope will happen in Egypt? And the president said, what I want is for the kids on the street to win and for the Google guy to become president, okay? <laughs> Given what happened next, right, the president's statement seems remarkably um, naive, to put, it, uh, to put it kindly, because as we know, the photogenic uh, youth of uh, Tahrir, including the Google guy, were rushed off stage and uh, replaced by uh, two uh, groups that were very different from the kind of uh, media darlings that had captured Western attention. Uh, Mubarak's military, on the one hand, which became the kind of interim ruler of Egypt, and uh, so-called uh, Islamists led by the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. Um, and um, it turned out that the new technologies that the activists used, that Facebook and Twitter, these things that we thought were really powerful, turned out to be no match for the really old technologies of gun and mosque that these uh, groups were able to control. And as a result, the shape of the post-Mubarak Egyptian order was really settled in negotiations between these two groups, the Islamists and the military. And what they settled on was rapid elections, which were dominated by Islamists. These are the results of the uh, first parliamentary election in Egypt. Um, and uh, the, the tall bar on the top is the 
uh, Freedom and Justice Party, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Brotherhood's party. And the party that came in second place in those elections is Hezb nur the Party of Light, which emerged from an even more orthodox Salafist uh, uh, movement. Um, Six months later, what happens is that not only does the Muslim Brotherhood now have, did, did the Muslim Brotherhood have control of the parliament, but they also captured the presidency. I'm gonna show you a lot of photographs here, by the way. This is the only one that I took. This is Egypt's president, uh, Mohamed Morsi. This is a photograph I took of him in 2005 when I was beginning my doctoral uh, dissertation research, and he was running for re-election in, uh, uh, to parliament in the town of uh, Zegezig, uh, uh, north of Cairo. Um, he was uh, uh, completely immune to uh, my charms. Um, in any case, uh, Mohamed Morsi became president. He won narrowly against a, a former general. The parliament, right, in a, right before he was elected, was dissolved by the courts, um, uh, but uh, we'll get to that. In any case, the Islamists really, after Mohamed Morsi's election, have really dominated the political space in Egypt. And as we know, in December of this year, they actually enacted a constitution that um, Mohamed al baradai who was uh, uh, a key uh, dissident uh, in Egypt and the former uh, head of the International Atomic Energy Agency and a Nobel laureate, he decried the Islamist constitution that was passed in December as violating freedom of religion, freedom of expression, independence of the judiciary. And so as a result, the tone of writing about Egypt has shifted really from this kind of sunny optimism to a kind of unremitting pessimism as these Islamists took the helm. And many of us who are uh, involved in this kind of uh, life of academic scribbling suddenly began to remember a lot of the political science theory that we had conveniently forgotten as we were cheerleading the revolutions. So we suddenly, our inner, uh, our inner modernization theorists started coming out again, right? And you're all, you may not be familiar with, why should anybody be familiar with political science theory? But um, there is a longstanding theory in political science, uh, a longstanding sense that the more developed a country is, the more likely it is to be able to get and keep democracy. And there's lots of reasons why this might be so, and it's, it's not necessarily important to think about the causal mechanisms by which this is the case, but a couple of scholars, one of whom is here at uh, New York University, Adam Shavorsky, uh, identified a kind of threshold uh, of wealth below, above which democracies uh, do not fail, right? So new democracies, places like Egypt, they fail all the time, except that above a kind of threshold of wealth, they tend to do really well, uh, they tend to persist, well, that threshold of wealth was Argentina's in 1976, right? On the eve of the coup that unseated Isabel uh, Perón. This is, uh, the red line represents Argentina's per capita GDP in 2005 constant dollars in 1976. And as you can see, most Arab countries, these are per capita GDPs of Arab countries, are poorer today than Argentina was in 1976. And the ones that are richer are oil well rich, and that creates its own, um, its own pathology. So um, there's all kinds of reasons, right, for us to now be pessimistic that, well, these guys were never going to be able to make it uh, to democracy. And so the question now shifts a little bit, and we think, okay, what democratic collapse is probably going to happen here. What's it going to look like? And the, one, uh, the one, one way it might look is that we might get a kind of detour into an Iranian-style theocracy, right? Could Egypt become an Islamic state, um, which would not be a liberal polity and would probably not even be a democratic one? And if you survey the evidence, there seems to be a little bit of evidence for this. So I mentioned the constitution that was passed in uh, December. Well. This constitution has an outsized role for Islam in political life. And if you compare it with previous constitutions, previous constitutions in Egypt mentioned Islam as the religion of the state, uh, sort of by in the 70s and then later in the 80s. They even went a little bit further and said that the Sharia, Islamic jurisprudence, the principles of the Sharia will form the major source of legislation, okay? So there was always, even under Mubarak, there was this kind of nod to this uh, uh, Islamic uh, sensibility. Um, and you might look at the new constitution and compare it to what they had there. Well, 
Article 2 of the Constitution, which is always the article that's mentioned this, is the same. So you might say, oh, pretty good so far, okay? They, they haven't changed very much, uh, okay? So Article 2 still says the principles of the Sharia are the principal source of legislation. And then Article 3 even says, hey, you know what? If you're a Christian or one of the 12 Jews in Egypt, uh, don't worry, you're not going to be subject to the Sharia. We're going to allow you to be governed in your personal status matters, marriage, divorce, etc., by your own canon law. So you look at this and you say, well, this is actually a bit of an improvement on what we had before. But then you keep reading and you get to Article 4 of the Constitution, which accords to Al Azhar University, which is a large state uh, university that is also uh, one of the major seats of Islamic learning in the Sunni Muslim world. And you see a couple of things. So you see that, um, that Al Azhar is, you know, they describe Al Azhar. The key point that you should look at is that Al Azhar senior scholars are to be consulted in matters pertaining to Islamic Sharia. So they've said, all laws are going to be based on the principles of Islamic Sharia, and we're going to consult the Al Azhar senior scholars on matters pertaining to Sharia. In other words, we're going to consult Al Azhar on all laws. Okay. So this is a little bit uh, problematic as well. I've talked to Egyptian politicians, and they say, "Well, it will be voluntary. It's not necessary. It's not. They, they're not. Uh, it's the parliamentarians are not forced to consult." Uh, and then you get Article Two Nineteen. So this issue, artic in Article 2, Article 2 says Islam is the religion and the principles of Islamic Sharia are the principal source of legislation. Now you may be looking at this and say, what do they mean by that? Is that just bad writing? Yeah, it's actually really important, okay? Because when you say the principles of Islamic Sharia are the major, major source of legislation, you know, the question is, what do you mean by principles, okay? And if you'd ask a judge during the Mubarak era, they'd say, oh, the principles of Islamic Sharia, these are the principles uh, that undergird all decent legal systems around the world, equality, dignity, etc. Right? Very vague, very capacious, okay? In Article 219 of the new constitution, they have sought to define precisely what is meant by principles of Sharia. And no longer is it this kind of vague, capacious, generally liberal kind of conception, but it is in fact a very conservative, hidebound conception that ties the interpretation of the principles of Sharia very closely to existing bodies of Islamic jurisprudence. Okay. So it is almost like saying the principles of the Sharia mean the letter of the Sharia. So, um, so this is pretty uh, problematic, I think, if you care about Egypt being a liberal polity. Um, if you care about Egypt being a democracy, okay, and a democracy reflects in large part the will of the people, you might be less um, uh, concerned because it turns out that Egyptians really like this. Okay? This is what Egyptians want. Okay. So this is data uh, collected by a colleague of mine at Princeton uh, uh, as part of an Arab, uh, 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 a survey of Arab countries. This is a survey of Egypt where they asked, um, you know, should the government and parliament enact laws according to Islamic law? And as you see, a majority of Egyptians either strongly agree or agree with this idea that parliament and uh, the government should enact uh, laws according to Islamic law. In 2000, the World Values Survey did a, a survey of Egypt, and they, a, they do this all over the world. They ask people things like, what do you think democracy means? Uh, they ask them well, you know, questions about t intended to uncover their basic political values. And one question they ask them is kind of a complicated question. They basically say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a bunch of, uh, uh, of, of practices or institutional features, and you tell me how essential they are to democracy. So for example, they might say, the right to vote. How essential is it to democracy on a scale of 1 to 10? And here in the US, we'd probably all say 10, right? It's extremely important. Okay. Um, one of the things they present is, OK, having religious authorities interpret the laws, how essential is that to democracy on a scale of 1 to 10? Here in the US, we'd all say not at all essential to democracy, perhaps inimical to democracy. In Egypt, healthy majorities are on this side of the scale, believe that having religious authorities interpret the laws is an essential feature of democracy. So clearly, there are some different preferences here going on. 
And we can ask why they exist, but they, they clearly exist. So th this might cause you to be really nervous, right? Really concerned about the type of polity you're going to get there. But we do have some countervailing evidence. And I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this. Um, but for example, if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood's discourse, okay, um, I think they've come to realize that you know, trying to uh, win re-election and trying to win the allegiance of the people basically solely on a steady diet of Islamic uh, sweet nothings is not going to win. It's not going to, they at the end of the day are going to have to deliver development to this country. So this is a kind of word cloud that I made of the Mohammed Morsi's uh, 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 re uh, election platform uh, for the presidential election, the sort of electoral program. And the big word in the middle, you all know, read Arabic so I can move on, right? Uh, the big word in the middle is et tenmeya, right? Development. And in fact, it's, we can't really find, you know, the other big words are qata, sector, ziyada, increase, Egypt, mosque. The economy, development. I mean, Islam really features very in a very limited sense here, right? Because they understand that at the end of the day, when you're in power, it's not about simply enacting a kind of religiously conservative agenda, but it's about um, it's about development. Um, here's another uh, a photograph that I actually took off of the Muslim Brotherhood's webpage that I thought spoke volumes about the shifts that the Muslim Brotherhood has had to and may continue to have to make in order to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, to, in order to abandon a little bit this extremism. This is a, a poster of Mohammed Morsi, and on the top it says, well, let me, on the top it says Erdogan Masr, okay, the Erdogan of Egypt, okay. Erdogan is the, is the Prime Minister of Turkey. Why is, this, uh, why is this remarkable to me? Well, it's remarkable because Mohamed Morsi in 2007 wrote an article about the AK party, the Turkish Islamist party, in which he basically said, these people are a kind of American model of Islamism. They do not call for the implementation of the Sharia, and therefore they are, ex they are as distant from us as any secular party. And now, fast forward to a point to a period where Erdogan is extremely popular in Egypt, the Turkish model is an extremely popular model in Egypt, and suddenly his supporters are calling him the Erdogan of Egypt. Right? So that suggests to me that if there is going to be a kind of a democratic collapse or a detour into something worse, it's not necessarily going to be a detour into an Iranian-style theocracy. The bigger and more important question from my standpoint is, is Egypt going to become another one-party state? Right? In other words, the Muslim Brotherhood, is the Muslim Brotherhood going to inhabit the same role that uh, the National Democratic Party of Hosni Mubarak uh, inhabited? Right? That to me is the, uh, is, is the real question. And there's a lot of evidence uh, for this too, right? We know that uh, Mohamed Morsi, after getting elected, has really tried to um, consolidate his power and the power of the Muslim Brotherhood. We know, for example, that the Muslim Brotherhood controls the Shura Council, which is the upper house of the Egyptian parliament. The Shura Council is worthless for anything except it has one role, okay? And that role is to hire and fire all of the editors of the state-owned newspapers, which are the biggest newspapers in Egypt. And of course, they have systematically gone about making sure that in the top editorial positions, they have writers and, and editors who are sympathetic to the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay? So they have tried to capture the commanding heights of the media. We know that in November, Mohammed Morsi, because he's been tussling with the judges, right? The judges have been trying to, to stop the Islamist train. Well, Mohammed Morsi, in November, uh, issued a decree saying, all of my decisions are above any kind of judicial review. Okay. So this was alarming, right? Um, and he eventually had to step uh, back from this, but it was nonetheless a kind of uh, insight into the kind of leader he wanted to become and the kind of, uh, sort of, the kind of move that the Muslim Brotherhood thought would be legitimate to make. Um, and then finally, if you look at the Egyptian constitution, I wish I'd made a slide of this, uh, one of the articles at the very end of the Egyptian constitution is designed to limit political opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood. And it specifically 
per prevents from running in elections anybody who ran in elections on the banner of the National Democratic Party in 2010 and 2005. Muslim Brotherhood says, yes, we put this in the Constitution in order to cleanse the political space of all of these former cronies of the regime. But the fact is, these people who had gotten elected on the ruling party's banner often weren't really stalwart members of the ruling party. They were local notables, local businessmen who you know, the ruling party attracted to, you know, to sign up on their slate, but who probably would have run for parliament anyways. And basically what the Muslim Brotherhood is doing by trying to exclude these people from running for office is trying to exclude its most capable competitors from running. And of course, it looks like the courts are stopping that as well, but this is what they are trying to do, right? It's, I think these moves to establish the one party dominance are much more alarming than moves to establish um, a kind of Islamic polity. Now, the question is, are people going for it? And there's some mixed evidence, in fact, that you know, people are beginning to actually punish the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood continues to win elections, but it, can, it does so with an ever-shrinking base of voters. Okay? So if you look in March 2011, that was when there was a constitutional referendum, and the Muslim brother, and it was basically it was a referendum on whether to have elections uh, quickly or not. And the Muslim Brotherhood wanted to have elections quickly, and they encouraged people to vote yes. And about 30% of eligible voters, uh, or sorry, registered voters, voted yes. Okay, so everybody who could have voted, right? Of those, 30% voted yes. I'm not. This is not of people who actually voted. People who actually voted. It was 77%. Um, then in the parliamentary election, it was about 20% of registered voters voted for Mohamed Morsi. In the, uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood. In the presidential election, it's only a little bit over 10%, right? So f m many fewer people actually go and vote for the Muslim Brotherhood. Then, you know, you have the constitutional referendum, which it's now, you know, above 25%. But again, you know, constitutional referenda aren't just referenda on the Muslim Brotherhood. They're also referenda on stability, et cetera. But so the general trend to me seems to be people are turning away from this movement, and it's not surprising to me that they're doing so because the economic picture in Egypt is terrible, right? Tourism is down uh, more than uh, $2 billion from, uh, uh, from uh, it, where it was uh, under uh, Mubarak. So it was, it, was, uh, it was, the year prior to the revolution, it was something like $12.5 billion, now it's $10 billion. Um, and tourism is a major source of foreign reserves. Foreign reserves are down from 36 billion down to about 13 billion today. And this is important because Egypt needs a lot of foreign reserves to cover its wheat importation bill because e Egypt is the biggest importer of wheat in the world for its massive bread subsidy program. Uh, the Egyptian pound is down, inflation is up. I mean, there has been a, a significant amount of immiseration going on. And Egypt is trying now, the Morsi government is trying to construct a deal with the IMF that would give it a loan of about $4.8 billion, and that would then open the door to another $10 billion from the US and the EU, et cetera. Um, but that deal is stalling because there's all of this unrest. And to me, it's not even clear that if they make the deal, uh, Mohamed Morsi has the political ability or political will to fulfill it because the deal requires all of these very tough economic reforms that even Mubarak's government didn't feel it was strong enough uh, to make. So, and to give you an example, you know, on December 10th of, this, of last year, Morsi floated one of the reforms, which was to implement some taxes, some sales taxes and immediately had to withdraw it because there was so much opposition from within his own party. Um, so it seems to me that if he's finally really forced to implement these uh, IMF reforms, he's going to face some massive protests, and uh, it will further weaken his government. And he can't count on Qatar, which is the only reason this graph didn't go down further. Uh, Qatar gave, has given Egypt about $5 billion, uh, but the Qatari finance minister recently said um, no more money was going to be forthcoming. So this is a, a huge, uh, the economy is a huge problem, and it is a huge reason why I think support for the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and for Mohamed Morsi's government may be uh, dwindling. How much time do I have left? Five minutes? Okay, so I will, I have some great data here, but I'm going to skip it. Um, okay. So the question is, 
what are the prospects for pluralism? What are the prospects? So we, we have this picture of a Muslim Brotherhood government that's doing its best to become a one party, dominant party, but that nonetheless is, uh, is, faces some serious economic problems and as a result, a diminution in its popularity. So what are the, what, what are the prospects though that we'll get some real pluralism uh, in this country? And I, I see a few sources of potential pluralism. The first is from a kind of resurgent left, okay? Lots of people for the longest time had told us that in Egypt, the left was dead. And in the Middle East, they generally tell us this. The left is dead because it is associated with failure, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, etc. But if you survey Egyptians, and this is also data from the World Values Survey, and you ask them, where do you put yourself? Where do you think of yourself politically? Do you think of yourself as Yasseri, al Yasar, as a leftist, or al Yamin on the right? And most Egyptians stick themselves in the middle. That's what this shape is, sort of the uh, kind of showing the distribution of Egyptians. But a lot of Egyptians consider themselves on the left. I did a survey in uh, November of 2011 where I asked people a bunch of uh, specific policy questions, right? What kind, you know, so for example, I asked them, hey, some people think that the government should be responsible for seeing to a job and a standard of living for people, and others think that individuals should, be, uh, should just fend for themselves. Where do you put yourself on the spectrum? Most Egyptians think it's, welfare is the responsibility of the government. You talk to them about redistribution. That you say, hey, some people say that the government should raise taxes in order to redistribute wealth from rich to poor. Okay? Uh, other people think that the government shouldn't do any redistribution, should only focus on development. Most Egyptians are highly redistributive. Okay? And so it seems to me that there is this, this latent uh, you know, constituency for a kind of statist, redistributionist politics that may not be, may not conform to the kind of neoliberal economic um, uh, sort of uh, hegemonic ideals that we have, but that nonetheless might represent a way of getting away from the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think if you look, I think people have started to express these uh, views electorally. If you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, vote shares of candidates in the first round of the Egyptian presidential election, and you see Mohamed Morsi got about 25%, Ahmed Shafi, who's a former general and Mubarak's last prime minister, got a little bit less than that. But the guy who comes in third place with about 23%, okay, is this man, okay, a leftist, okay, named Hamdin Sabahi, okay, who is the head of a very small political party, okay. But I think because he appealed to uh, Egyptians' desires for a kind of uh, redistributive politics, he was able to come within striking distance of the storied Muslim Brotherhood, right? Remember everything that we've read about the Muslim Brotherhood. How could it be that the Muslim Brotherhood, this powerful organization that has been operating in Egypt for 85 years, it only exceeds this, you know, this former journalist, Hamdin Sabahi, by a couple of, of you know, points? Uh, um, so that seems to me to be uh, powerful evidence that there is this potential for moving beyond uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Here's a little bit more evidence. So what I did was I plotted, the, each of these dots represents a, like a county in Egypt. And what I did was I plotted the first round votes for Sabahi um, against the adult illiteracy rate, just you know, for fun. And it sort of looks like this, but I'm kind of being dishonest because I, I actually didn't show you some of the data. It actually looks like this. There's a bunch of these outliers way on the top. Okay? And I said to myself, what are those outliers? Like, what are those places? Why did these, they're places with high, so generally places with high illiteracy didn't vote for this guy, except those places. And I said, what, what are they? Well, they happen to be the places, you know, Kafr Sheikh, which is the governorate or the state that he's from. Okay? So that spoke to me very powerfully of the fact that, look, when the Egyptians come to vote, they you know, vote for a lot of different reasons. And sometimes you vote for the guy because he's a charismatic guy from your hometown. And we see the same thing with another candidate, uh, Ahmed Shafi, whose uh, biggest vote shares came from the place where Mubarak and Sadat were from, and places that really wanted to return to the old, uh, the old uh, regime. And so my point is that there is this latent desire among people for some alternative to the Brotherhood, whether it be based on 
you know, uh, redistributive politics, or whether it be based solely on the personal charisma of, of leaders who are from your home area. But I think that represents some potential for moving beyond uh, the brothers. Okay, I'm going to end now. What should the U.S. do? We have to end, end every talk in the U.S. with this question, right? Um, um, so I, I, would, I would make three arguments. I would say the first, this is really the, the main argument, is that we should embrace instability. Okay. If you look at Egypt right now and you look at the massive protests that are going on, there is a tendency to, to put your head in your hands and say, everything's going to hell in Egypt. It is a disaster. The New York Times last week called on the Egyptian opposition and the Egyptian leadership to come to get to consensus to solve the country's problem. John Kerry, Secretary of State John Kerry said that the, Egypt, the opposition and the Muslim Brotherhood need to come together. I think this is actually a mistake. Okay? I think that, in fact, what you have right now in Egypt is far more important to the health of democracy than consensus. Right? What you have in Egypt now is the prospect of accountability. Right? Because people are protesting the Muslim Brotherhood. They know who to blame for policy failures. Okay? This is an important thing. Um, you know, it's, you know, several scholars have noted this, greater people than myself, that you know, when you build consensus, that just is a recipe for collusion and corruption. What you really want is opposition. Okay? And you have that now in Egypt. And so we in the United States should kind of embrace that. We should be happy that there is opposition in Egypt and that there is a prospect of accountability for leaders. Okay? So what should we do? We should talk to everybody. We should make sure that we do not seem to be favoring one group over another. In Egypt, lots of people now really feel very strongly, and I think this is reflected in Dr. Mustafa's remarks as well, that we somehow favor the Muslim Brotherhood, either because we think the Muslim Brotherhood is the only group capable of bringing stability, or because there is some sympathy that is developed over time with them. Um, but I think the US needs to talk to everybody and dispel this sense. And what it really needs to, what we really need to do is allow the Egyptian political process to take its course, that allow Egypt to actually achieve uh, democracy is going to mean that this opposition that you find in the street, happening in the streets is going to have to be allowed to continue. And the problem is that militaries generally don't like that, right? Militaries in Egypt and the world over generally tend to look at opposition and think of it as instability. And they think it is our job to come in and restore stability. But restoring stability is often smothering democracy in the cradle. And so if we do anything in Egypt, if it is just to keep the military, to keep the army out of politics, and to allow these oppositions to you know, develop, to establish parties, to challenge the regime, to force the regime to make accommodations with them, I think that would be the best thing that we could do. And I will end there. Thank you.